With the Indigo disc just released and my journey in Scarlet and Violet almost over, I've not got much time left to satisfy my crippling addiction to collecting shiny Pokemon. So I'm going to try and hunt down my team for the DLC using different methods and games before heading into this new adventure. The first time my team technically wasn't a hunt though since I was going to bring my little golden buddy Drifting along with me that I evolved at the end of my adventure in Kizakami since there were rumours of it getting a new evolution. With my little golden friend shaped syrup ball by my side, I chose the rest of my team with help from a chat and time was ticking down to catch them all before release day. Gliscor was my first target since it was recently added in Kitakami. This wasn't a hard hunt by any means, having just to load up the teal mask in Scarlet, make a shiny sandwich and look out for my classic coloured Gligars. After choosing my favourite of the two and evolving them into Gliscor, I felt like moving on to a different style of hunt. This took place in Legends Arceus during a 12 hour stream I did for my birthday. My chat could play shiny sounds to try and gaslight me into looking for non-existent shinies. I kept searching for a shiny Alpha Electivire that I didn't find. While I was searching through mass outbreaks, I did find a real shiny and it happened to be an elected. It's not an Alpha, but I'll take it. Moving on to the next member. I wanted to find a shiny Duraladon because it was going to get a new evolution called Archaladon in the new DLC. This took me into shield and also took a bit longer than the others since I decided to use a Masuda method in sword and shield to try and find it. And eventually I did after only 486 eggs. It's not super noticeable, but I had hoped that its evolution would have a better color scheme. I kept hatching the rest of the eggs I collected and as if the game was trying to make up for going slightly over odds. I ended up finding another two in the last batch of eggs. These will be added to my shiny decks, but as I'm a glutton for punishment, I shifted my focus over to Scarlet again. Except this time, I was going for a different egg I hatched during my Teal Mask playthrough. That being Piplup. I was finishing editing my 24 hour camping hunt video and collecting eggs to mass hatch in the background. This took a bit longer than Duraladon, but after five days and 1044 eggs hatched, an upgraded shiny version of the Piplup that Jacques had gifted me in Kitakami appeared. Now with 5 out of 6 collected, I had one target left and this was going to be hard since I was going to jump into Violet this time and hunt down an Illumise. The hunt wasn't the issue here though, making the sandwich was. I tried earlier for what must have been nearly an hour just to get the cherry tomatoes to stay in place long enough to count. And it was daytime so they wouldn't even spawn after I managed to do this. Coming back to it, I wanted to find an easier recipe that wouldn't be almost impossible for me to make. And that I did. For this recipe, I only needed three little cherry tomatoes and two salty Herba Mystica to get the sparkle and power I was looking for. And turns out, I didn't even need it because I had an Illumise outbreak. And after my first reset, I forgot to make the sandwich. But still somehow found my golden glow bug regardless. This was the last member of the team. So with a little help from a chat to nickname them, it was time to get them all battle ready and jump into the new DLC. With a handicap apparently, since I couldn't transfer Electivire and Duraludon into my game straight away since Pokemon Home was down for maintenance when the DLC released. But we move. Over at the Academy, I met up with one of Clavel's friends who chose me specifically to go on an exchange trip to the Blueberry Academy. I had a brief conversation with Clavel's old friend Serrano, we flew over to Yanova, and we were quickly introduced to a student called Lacey, who my chat seemed to really want to talk to. She seemed to know more about the academy than Serrano, who was only focused on how blue the place is. In the middle of the big blue sea? We're for sure in safer hands with Lacey, and I can also finally move around once again, heading up to the academy's entrance. Oh my god, I love smoke meat too! Sorry, lost my composure there for a second. Almost at the entrance. Wait, is what Director Serrano said. Not letting me or Lacey take another step without agreeing to battle for his view and pleasure. And setting the stage for the rest of the DLC was sent into a double battle against her, which left me with only three Pokemon standing out of the four I had with me. I promise I'll try not to bring this up. This little break from the tour did give me a moment to get changed into the school's uniform and then immediately get changed into the tracksuit since it's not quite a flashy Jinbei, but it'll do since it's not a uniform either. Now that I fit in with the rest of the school, I walk down into the terrarium that we've heard so much about from all the trailers. Lacey, curious as ever, seeing my eyes as wide as can be, wanted to know out of all the biomes I could see, which one caught my attention. So I randomly chose the Craggy Canyon biome and she offhandedly mentions that there's an 
ore in this biome called charge stone. Another one for the Yenova confirmed basket. Serrano cut her off to point out the terrarium orb that he paid someone else to make, which is how the world works. And also how terrestrialism works within the school grounds. He stumbles through his words, trying to explain it in a workings before he's saved by the bell. Calling all the students taking part in a battle class to start making their way to the coastal biome. Lacey invites us to come watch the class. The director gave me the blueberry Pokedex. And when I got there, my new outfit managed to trick the teacher into thinking I was part of the class as well. The teacher was going over the subject of regional forms, which after completing two Pokedexes in this game alone, you'd probably be able to guess that I know this already. We were given the task to go out and specifically find an Alolan form Pokemon, catch it, bring it back to the teacher, and show it to him to pass the class. Now it was about 2 a.m. on release day morning? Night? I guess it depends on how you look at it really. So I caught the first regional form I saw, which happened to be a slowpoke. Nope. Sorry. Knocked that one out. Well, how about Diglett? Nope. Did the same again. And speaking of the same again, I found another slowpoke. And after a few failed attempts, it finally stayed in its Pokeball. Anyone watching who's smarter than me could have pointed out that this is a Galarian form slowpoke. But you went there, so it took the teacher to actually point this out to me. If I wouldn't have knocked out that Diglett, this wouldn't have been an issue. But moving on, I went out and caught an alone executor, which finally helped me pass the test. With the class finished for the day, everyone was sent home, or back to the dorms at least. And Lacey stopped me to catch up after the class and let me know how stupid I looked when I first turned up at the academy. She went on to explain that they have their own cryptocurrency on campus called Blueberry Points, or BP for short. And the student at the entrance wasn't excited to eat some meat cooked over a charcoal grill. He was talking about his love for blueberry quests, which are also known as BBQs. Not too long after this, I was left to explore the terrarium before immediately getting a call from an old friend. Carman had got word that I was visiting the school and wanted to meet up in the central plaza to reminisce about the adventures we'd been on in Kitakami. After quite literally landing in the central plaza, Carman was already busy talking to someone else. So I did the obvious thing and just stood there so I could eavesdrop on what they were saying, just in case it was about me. A friend seemed to notice me awkwardly staring at the two of them and pointed it out. Carman knew straight away who it was and was super happy to see me. Until I was maybe a bit too honest and said that I didn't miss her out loud. Then she was immediately ready to take my life with her own two hands. The mysterious friend she was talking to sensed the awkwardness and took the first excuse she could to walk away and give some space. For all time's sake, Carman challenged me to a battle and nothing had changed. Except a battle style not matching relationship status going from single to double. She did get through half of my team. Or what's left of it before history repeated itself. Speaking of old times, I hadn't seen Kieran yet. Although I think I spoke too soon because there was someone mouthing off in the distance. And it's apparently Kieran, I think. Just with an updo and an attitude. Well, more of an attitude than when I last saw him. Exhibit A, he's kicking off at someone even after they said they were having issues at home instead of trying to help out. Carmine pretty much nailed it and so did mysterious character number three, also known as Drayton. Turns out he is, was the strongest trainer at the academy. He was a bit more welcoming than Kieran seemed to be, inviting me to join the special club and come see the club room. And I guess Carmine's coming too. When we got there, Drayton filled me in on how they do things here. Specifically, how they decide who the strongest trainer is. Apparently they have a discount elite four called the BB League and I get to be a part of it, but only on a trial basis. I can't blame them for this, since being one of like 20 Paldean champions isn't really that prestigious when you think about it. This still lets me use the PC though, which is going to come in handy for completing the DLC. And speaking of completing the DLC, I'm going to have to complete another Pokedex, but this time Drayton decided to give me a little help and handed me over a catch and charm to make things just that little bit easier. He might have been trying to butter me up with this gift since he wanted to have a cafeteria date to talk details about me officially joining the club. Carman seemed to get a little jealous after this and decided to skip a couple steps in the dating process by bringing me back to my own dorm room. But I've had enough awkward situations today so I'm gonna head out to my date with a guy I just met to sign a contract I haven't read. We had a quick glance at the menu and I think Drayton might be a man after my own heart choosing the academy special that happens to give sparkle and power for all types. 
It was all going well until we were rudely interrupted by Kieran and a few of what I think he might call acquaintances. Turns out Drayton had an ulterior motive to our date since they were all invited by him as well. My assumption was correct since none of them had chosen to tell Kieran that I'd arrived here and he was taken completely off guard by me sitting right in front of him somehow. Bringing everything back on track, there was an issue with me joining the school club since I'm technically not a student at the school. So everyone decided to take votes on whether I should be allowed to join or not. Drayton voted yes, Lacey voted no, Crispin voted yes, and Amaris declined the proposition. Leaving us at a stalemate and Kieran with the deciding vote. As your typical edgy teenager would, he gave a vague answer to a question we didn't ask, which somehow meant that I was allowed to join the club. Drayton apologized for this, but that's pretty useless at this point, so we just headed straight to the entrance to get me all officially signed up. Or try to. Thankfully, Kieran's weird obsession with me meant this wouldn't be an issue. Let me skirt the rules and get on with the rest of the story. The front desk attendant marked the location of the Elite Four members on my map, and I was finally on my way to conquer another league that had a champion title that was actually worth the paper it was written on this time. The worthless title I already had wouldn't let me avoid doing the trials though, so I was just hoping that these trials will be better than the ones included in the base game. The first stop on my path to the top was Crispin's trial. After paying the entrance fee of 50 VP, an Elite Four of Blueberry showed his face to D, but little did he know just how it would go, I push him out of his own league to be one of the peasants below. <laughs> Sorry, I'll let the festive season take over for a second there. And my penance for this will be rightly saved, because Crispin tasked me with making the spiciest sandwich I could, which is slightly masochistic, but I can appreciate that. I'm just happy it's not me doing it this time. This was basically a fetch quest where you had to figure out the order to collect everything in. A few battles, some negotiating, and a YouTube thumbnail face taken meant that me and Crispin had completed our challenges. But I wasn't going to take him on in battle straight away since I still had a couple slots missing in my roster. Instead, I set up a union circle for me and some viewers to grind out BP so I could pay my way into the other Elite Four trials. Not saying I got distracted from doing quests, but I may have accidentally found the best feature introduced in the DLC. The Synchro Machine. The magical device that lets me run around as all the shiny Pokemon I'd hunted like it was a mystery dungeon game. ADHD tendencies aside, I got back to grinding out the BBQs and very quickly had enough BP to continue on with the trials. It was onto the coastal biome to take on Lacey's Elite Four trial next, if you can call it that. She basically wanted me to answer some questions by touching Pokemon in different places. I'm really hoping she got consent for this or it'd be really incriminating to include this in a video. I rightfully guessed how Lacey sleeps with a Pokemon and passed the second of the four trials I was tasked with. Wanting to distance myself immediately from what just happened, I made my way over to the polar biome for Drayton's elite trial. Being the good guy he is, Drayton covered the cost of the trial for me and brought me up to the main stage to explain what was going to happen. His trial involved throwing out all the prep I did for the DLC by collecting my team, which thankfully was only four members at this point. Then I had to build a whole new team from scratch using only Pokemon from the surrounding terrarium. Seeing the floor and the dragon trainer being placed in an ice biome, I went and collected five Pokemon that I hopefully wouldn't have to train because not only am I lazy, but I also don't like myself all that much, so why would I go for the surefire win? Surprisingly, this may have been one of the times my laziness had paid off since I managed to defeat all three trainers with minimal casualties. Partially because I wasn't explicitly told I couldn't heal in between battles, so that's an in for not being specific with the rules for his trial. Now the third trial was complete, it was time to get my original team out of the boxes and move on to the final trial in the canyon biome. One last paywall passed and Amorous showed up to lead me over to where the trial would take place. I was actually excited for this one since it was a flying time trial. Only one issue with this, and that's that Coridon can't fly. Just sort of forward style. Amorous sought as much and gave it some supplements to enhance its flying abilities. Would have been nice to have asked first, but I'm also not complaining with the outcome. I am complaining about the sadistic developer who set the controls for flying to not be inverted by default. But being the top tier gamer I am, this didn't phase me and like my driving test, I passed first time. With the final trial complete, it was time for me to call it for the night since it was 6am and I only had 3 hours before I needed to turn up to my actual job. Although I did finally get a moment that I've wanted for so long. Right before I was about to end stream, I noticed something pop out of the ground that was a little suspicious, and on closer inspection, it happened to be a shiny Venonat. 
ending day one on a high, I also ended stream and tried to figure out how I was going to solve my issue of not having all my team with me to take on the Elite Four. After taking a quick look at the Pokemon Home Maintenance notes, I knew it wasn't going to be possible to bring in my original team to take on the DLC, at least straight away. So I did the next best thing. I took the hint the game was trying to give me at the end of day one and went on a couple shiny hunts to find temporary replacements for the absent team members. The first of these being Duraludon, which went better and worse than expected. With a Steel Sparkle and Power Sandwich active, I found not one, but three shinies. To point out why this wasn't a good thing, I was hunting Duraludon, but the first two Pokemon I found were Beldum and Matang. Great shinies! Don't get me wrong, and they're actually some of my favorites, but they're not Duraludon. Luckily, in the last couple of minutes of the sandwich, I managed to find one with its little red light turned off. One replacement down, it was on to find an Inelected. This was even harder to spot since the light could make them all look shiny depending on the time of day. Thankfully, I managed to somehow spot it and catch it before I went live to finish off the last of the DLC story. Jumping back into day two, I started the stream by evolving Electid into Electabuzz and then trading with myself to evolve it into Electivire. Then, taking the Duraldon on court and using a Metal Alloy to make it evolve into Archaladon, I immediately knew this was going to be one of my favorite Pokemon, regardless of the fact that it has a great gold metal colored shiny. With those out the way, it was time to decide which of the Elite Four members I'd be taking on first. Some consult with my chat led me to find out that all of my team weren't fully evolved and that I should probably take on Drayton first since he'd give me a new move called Dragon Cheer, which would allow Dripplin to evolve further. So that's exactly what I did. It wasn't an easy battle since Scepter took me by surprise, managing to just about scrape a win with two Pokemon left standing. But I've got to give it to him, because for someone who just lost a battle, Drayton seemed quite happy with himself, inviting me to be a full member of the club and even taking a photo to commemorate the occasion. Then he ran off to grab the TM for me so I could teach it to Dripplin. To Driplin. Well, I accidentally taught it to Archaladon for some reason. I can't even tell you what I was thinking. But regardless, it meant I needed to make another one to evolve my little Kitakami buddy. All the materials I needed were in my bag, except for Lapras Tears. Oh. I beat up some Lapras until they were crying and begging for mercy, then used the tears of my fallen enemies to release the power of my Golden Dragon. With the move taught and Driplin leveled up, it was finally time. I don't know what I was expecting it to evolve into, but it wasn't that. I'm not complaining, I absolutely love it, and it's another instant favorite in my books. Obviously, I had to take my newly evolved buddy, buddies? For a spin, and I wasn't the only one who loved it since it was a trainer who was either trying to take a selfie with it or attack it. Honestly, I still haven't figured that out. Distractions aside, it's time to get back on track with beating the Elite Four by challenging Crispin next. Not gonna lie, I was a little let down that he didn't have a full team of Magmortar like he showed during his sandwich tasting. But it didn't really make any difference since Electivire took a hit for the team before Gliscor could finish off his Blaziken and secure the victory for us. As always, Crispin and I took a picture to remember the moment before it was time to move on to the third member of the Elite Four. Oh, wait, Kieran's got something to say. Guess I'm just going to ignore him like I did all two Kitakami and head on over to the coastal biome to face Lacey. I'd already beaten her once, so it was time to see if that was just pure luck. <laughs> nope. I pretty much steamrolled her entire team without an issue, just letting Gramble hit our Chalodon to build us defenses and walk it home from there. A little post-battle chat with Lacey led to me playing Wingman for my chat, only to be shot down immediately. She may have felt sorry for me though, so we still took a picture to remind me never to try that again. In an attempt to repress what just happened, there was only one battle left before I had my shot at putting Kieran back in his place and becoming the Blueberry Academy champion. Over in the canyon biome, Amaris was waiting for me to finally accept the proposition, and like a friend Carman, she assumed the position, ready for the battle that would decide Kieran's opposition. I don't know why I made this rhyme, but in due time, it was the end of the line and victory was mine. Okay, I promise I'll try not to let that happen again. One last photo taken, Drayton made an appearance, confirming that the time had come for me to challenge Kieran for his championship title. Just in case this wasn't obvious enough, Kieran also showed up, probably saying something like, I'm so obsessed with you, I'm so edgy, blah blah blah. At least, I assume that's what he said because I wasn't paying any attention to him. 
But all I know is that he's gotten a little too big for his boots and I'm the only one that can bring him back down a peg. After talking to the front desk and letting them know I was ready for the battle ahead, Kieran showed up with a monologue prepared and everything just for me because he knows how to make a guy feel special. Now you can assume what happened from here, but just for my own enjoyment, I'm still going to show you some brief highlights from the battle with Electivire terrestrializing at the end to finish off his Grim Snarl, defeating Kieran and conquering this new land and claiming it for my own like a true Brit. He'd apparently forgotten how to handle defeat, even though he got really used to it during our adventures in Kitakami. Ever the opportunist though, Drayton jumped in at the first chance to call Kieran the ex-champion and not realising the irony of that coming from the ex-ex-champion. That's one ex away from not being child friendly. Breaking character for a second, Drayton had a little heart to heart with Kieran, but he still didn't get what we were trying to say. Rudely interrupted by the school announcement, me, Kieran, Carman, and Drayton were invited up to classroom 14 to meet with Miss Briar, who'd been weirdly absent during my whole time at the academy so far. Arriving in the classroom with Drayton loudly announcing our entrance, we'd apparently got there before the special guest that Miss Briar had brought along. So we all took a seat while we waited for them to finish the tour of the school, and it turned out that the special guests Briar invited were actually Gita and Rika, who weren't expecting me to be there or that had already been crowned champion of the academy. She then went on to explain the original expedition into Area Zero that took place more than a decade ago, stressing how dangerous it can be and hinting that the area should be off limits to everyone. Also pointing out that more research needed to be done in and around Area Zero and it needed to be done soon. Apparently giving out the champion title like presents of Christmas hadn't led to having the most capable of personnel. So they resorted to coming to the Blueberry Academy instead. It's not mandatory to take part, but as you might expect, we're all in. Except for Drayton, which you probably already guessed as well. Gita was grateful that most of us volunteered for the expedition and probably also for the free child labor she just enlisted. At least it's being led by Miss Briar, who only has a small obsession with Area Zero and anything to do with the terrestrial phenomenon. Having been given the brief of what we needed to do, we were told to meet by the bridge as soon as we were ready. I was all set to go straight there, but before I left the room, Gita and Rika stopped me to have a couple words. They just wanted to congratulate me on my talents and lightly chastised me because they got wind of my unauthorized research trip into Area Zero with Penny, Arvin and Nimona. Gita saw the reason why we went into the depths in the first place though, which is why we weren't being punished for going down there without any permission. Rika still wasn't happy, but she let it slide for now. This time, thankfully, we'd all have permission to enter the Great Crater and investigate the time machine that she also seemed to know about. Yet, Gita seemed to have forgotten something important that she was supposed to give Miss Briar, and that was the Indigo Disc. With the knowledge that they were sending a group of kids down into the depths of Area Zero, which they've acknowledged is a dangerous place, and even some of the strongest trainers in Paldea don't have permission to enter. They waved me off with a smile and left us to go on our little happy fun time adventure. Finally able to leave the classroom and meet up with everyone by the bridge, Briar had learned a lesson since the last trip he went on, making sure everyone was okay before we left this time. And we all were, as ominous as Kieran tried to make it sound, not foreshadowing anything he might be planning. And one short flight across a pond later, we'd landed in the great crater of Paldea, except this time we were allowed to be here. Everyone was amazed by what they were seeing, but I've done enough shiny hunts here, so it didn't faze me anymore. Rightfully so, they put me in charge of leading everyone down to where the Zero Lab was located. Okay, me and Yas. Although, I think it just popped out of its Pokeball because it might enjoy messing with Carmine a little bit too much. I'm getting sidetracked again. In Briar or Heath's book, I'm sure that's probably important, but I can't tell you why. It mentions that there's somewhere even deeper than the bottom of Area Zero. Guess there's only one way to find out if that's true by literally diving head first into the depths. I showed them the deepest area we reached on our expedition, but something changed since I was last down here. The door was closed, but it was just a simple case of just using the panel and... Never mind. Mashing my hand against the panel didn't seem to work this time. But maybe if I... Show it the indigo disc? That's what I was going to say showed the disc we were conveniently given before we left. It presented its dish tray to us and I hesitantly inserted the disc just to end this awkward situation. At least I have Carmine's consent to do it, I guess. It worked and the elevator was redirected to go even deeper. 
I wasn't comfortable with all the freezing. So we watched the door opening all of its 5 FPS glory. And when deep when head entered the... We're in the lab now. And Carmine was getting a bit too excited. Now we're in the elevator. Briar was amazed by how the elevator went down and just kept going deeper. Okay, just give me a minute to recompose myself. All right, I should be good now. We arrived at the area under area zero, which was confirmed by Briar's phone that somehow had signaled this far underground. She also spotted a pile of long forgotten research notes stacked on a desk next to the lift and Briar just couldn't contain herself. She needed to read all of them straight away. These were Sada's original research notes from their time spent down here. At least before, you know, the incident. They covered a legendary Pokemon called Terrapagos and an undiscovered stellar terror type. Kieran had the right idea, just wanting to hurry up and go further it. Briar couldn't get enough and still hadn't had a fill. I'm trying, I really am, but they're not making it easy for me. We took steps on the rocky floor, eventually stumbling onto a large crystal-like structure. No, 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 I think I overcorrected. I just have to not be a complete child and get my mind out the gutter. Briar theorized that the crystal was made of some form of terrestrial energy, so we probably shouldn't attack it head on. Conveniently, there was a glowing Pokemon floating nearby, so why not attack that instead? That makes sense. When I encountered it, the Glamora terrestrialized into a type that I hadn't seen before, and I know exactly what to do in these kind of situations. You hit it as hard as you can with the biggest, heaviest thing you can find. Which seemed to work, making the crystal disappear and allowing us to move further on into the depths. Thinking ahead this time, I saw another one of these crystals. So before anyone could tell me what to do, I went and found another glowing Pokemon that was somehow linked to it and swiftly knocked it out, which opened the way deeper into the caves below. And try and guess what happened next? There was another crystal block in the way. So I went and found a different kind of shining Pokemon sent it off to have a nice little nap and opened up another path. One last crystal stood in the way, but this time I had to take a dip in the crystal lake, paddling up to an underground crystal tree and putting the last stellar Pokemon into a coma so we could finally make our way to the deepest part of Area Zero. On the way down, all our terror orbs started glowing, which meant we must be getting closer to Terrapagos. This is all Kieran needed to hear, and he ran off to try and find the hidden treasure of Area Zero. Oh, didn't realize that one worked too. Anywho, Briar wasn't far behind him, which meant me and Carmine were unfortunately the responsible adults in this situation. Finally catching up to them, they'd found an odd stone that stood out from the rest. And with me at the forefront of Kieran's mind, he used all his pent up teenage frustration to tug at the crystal and eventually have the whole thing come flying off. Briar took a stab in the dark that this was Terrapagos. And somehow she was right. The moment it popped out of its shell, it seemed to have imprinted on me and started taking its first steps as I got ready to add it to my living decks. But Kieran decided he didn't appreciate my Pokeball only way of doing things, grabbed Master Ball and threw it at Terrapagos. Three shakes later and Kieran had beaten me to catching Terrapagos. Now, Bri was all excited to start studying it firsthand and he was looking for any excuse at this point to challenge me to a battle and assert his dominance. I took his sister's advice, assumed a position, ready my Pokemon, and well, it changed form, but it wasn't all that strong if I'm being honest. After a little education from Miss Briar, Kieran took her advice and it was time for round two. Terrastal Boogaloo? Lazy jokes aside, he terrastalized Terrapagos, which almost blew all of us out of the cavern and revealed its stellar form. This almost literally backfired on him if it wasn't for Karidon blocking the attack it launched in his direction. In an attempt to put a stop to what was happening, Kieran tried to get it to return to its Pokeball, but I'm not the only one who has a strong dislike for him, and Terrapagos felt so strongly it destroyed the Master Ball, as well as what little pride he had left. So it was time for me and Carmine to step up, I guess, and clean up the mess he'd made. Or maybe just me. Being useless must just be genetic. Terrapagos seems to be a lot stronger this time around though. Stealing my Pokemon's Terrasal energy and taking them out one by one as I slowly chip through each of the multiple shields that seems to keep making. After a bit of convincing, Kieran finally decides to chip in with a bit of support in the last leg of the battle. And in a show of pity, I let him get the last hit in because I'm a gentleman like that. Also because I was going to be the one to catch it this time. I think I got the better end of that deal. And now with the whole ordeal over, Briar had immediate regret for what she'd done. Just to refresh your mind, 
That thing was almost getting Kieran killed by Tarapagos if it weren't for Caridon being a better thing than me and saving his life. This clearly hit a nerve with Carmine for obvious reasons and it might be smart to steer clear of her for a little bit. Kieran also said some stuff that might have taken a lot for him to say out loud or being super sentimental. But you guessed it by now, I wasn't even listening until he broke out into tears and just started crying. Trying to brush everything under the rug like nothing happened, Briar put on a smile and led the way back to the Blueberry Academy. And if I had to guess what was going through her mind as we all walked down the sunset lit bridge, I'd say she was probably crossing everything she had and hoping no one would lodge a complaint against her. Oh, and that's the end of the story for the Indigo Disc. It didn't happen this time. Roll the credits! I'm not going to make you sit through all of it, so we'll just skip right to the end. And as you might know by now, this isn't where the journey ends for me. I'm going to be doing everything in the DLC. Immediately after the credits finished, I got a call from Briar telling me to meet up with her in the classroom. Somehow, after everything that went on in the depths, she got permission from Gita to write a book about it. Which says to me that she omitted some important information about what happened down there. And she thinks giving me a copy of her book will keep me quiet. She's just lucky I'm going to be too busy with the post-game content to report this to anyone. The only thing I'm going to have time to do is take full advantage of my terror of not needing to be recharged since it was exposed to Terrapagos' terrestrial energy. Oh, and she's got one last thing. There's a weird man in a blue suit. We'll find him later, but that's me done for day two and on to the DLC's post-game content. Starting with the important things that will make my life easier. I went to visit Amaris to see if she had any more of those special herbs that made Caridon fly before. And she did. After that first taster she gave us, she knew I'd be back for more. Even preparing some ahead of time just for my convenience. This stuff mustn't be cheap, so I hope Caridon rations this. Never mind. I guess it has been with me for a while, so it's probably picked up some of my bad habits. It must have been good stuff as well because that acted fast. And because bad decisions are never punished, we now have the ability to fly whenever we want. That's more than acceptable to me. On to a secret side quest that no one's talking about. I need to get the dumbest profile picture possible. Perfect. Moving on. This tracksuit isn't bad, but I was kind of upset that I didn't match Dripplin anymore. So it's time to get my drip back. And I like Drayton's jacket, so it's time to battle him for it. Um, it might not be his jacket, but I wasn't mad, especially after seeing what it looked like on. Yeah, no, I was happy with this. It was time to show off my new look to everyone and see what they thought. Like Penny, although she seemed to be busy stalking her friends, who also seemed to be busy making a show of themselves. Or at least that's what I thought, but people seemed to be enjoying whatever it was that they were doing. I was with Penny on this one. Regardless though, they seemed to put her at ease knowing that they were settling into the school just fine. Me and Penny kept stalking all the other members around the school to see how they were getting on, and it seemed like we had nothing to worry about since they were all more normal than their outfits actually suggested. With Amanda Ease, she invited me back to her room because that's a normal thing to do it seems, where I got to see that she was a full-on degenerate gamer. No surprises there. But on the subject of appearances, I almost didn't recognise Giacomo or Eerie wearing normal school clothes. Getting straight into it, Giacomo propositions me with being a tutor for the team star bosses since some of them aren't doing as well in the classes and might have to repeat the year if they don't pick up the grades. So we hold a study session for everyone and between Atticus putting the moves on Eerie and needing to go fetch Mella because she dipped out mid-session to go look at veggies. I'd say it went pretty well, except for the fact that Penny couldn't drop a stalk in ways and found us doing this all without her, which gave her a major case of FOMO. But after we explained what was happening to her, she seemed to relax a little, even offering to help tutor the group herself. And like a good sitcom ending, we all laughed and everything was good. Letting me get on to spending the money that had been burning a hole in my pocket since the last DLC. And that I did, straight away. More so than I was expecting to. I found Atticus peddling some of his more unique creations in the Cascarafa market. And obviously I wanted more customization options for my character. So I was basically forced to buy them all. Joke's on me, because I didn't expect the auction to start at 100,000, sometimes ending up a triple that amount by the time the bidding was over and done with. They were all worth it though, especially the ball guy helmet. 
maybe my favorite clothing item that I'll probably never wear. At least it satisfies the collector in me having bought every item he had up for sale. But now I'm gonna have to try and save money by surviving on instant noodles and oxygen for the foreseeable future. I got fancy glow sticks though. I also got a lot of BBQs done while grinding out BP earlier and also a little grinding offline. So when I went to visit the weird guy in the blue suit standing at the entrance to the academy, he just kept giving me treats that could supposedly attract different legendary Pokemon. Not all of them though. I started to grind out some more solo and group quests with chat before he'd hand them over. In the middle of this, I upgraded the four biomes diversity with some of the points I'd saved up so that I could try and multitask a little by catching any of the start Pokemon I spotted as I completed the BBQs. To my surprise, by the time I ended stream for the night, I'd caught all of the starters available in the terrarium, as well as evolving them all up to the final forms. Continuing the grind the next day, we all hopped into a union circle again and cracked on with more quests. This was starting to drag on a bit, until I read the hint for the group quest which told me it was an electric type. And I know what you're thinking, why is this special? It's not. The shiny for brawler I found casually chilling on the beach right afterwards was though. But there were still quests that needed completing and ditto blocks that needed hunting. So I got back to the grind for a little bit and not too long later, I had all the quests completed so that Snackworth would finally give me the last of the treats I needed to be able to catch every legendary in one game. I wasn't quite free yet though. There are secret trades that you can get after inviting special coaches to the academy and talking to them at least three times. From some quick maths, this costs around 13,800 BP if you want to collect them all, which is obviously what I'm going to do. I still had some unclaimed upgrades in the club room's PC that were throwing off my count a little. So I used the points I'd saved up so far to buy them all and made a note of how many points I had left. Needing a change of scenery, I stupidly spent 300 points redecorating the club room. But it looks so nice. It might not have been a smart move, but it was definitely worth it. Like we used to by now, I got back on my BBQs and eventually had all the points I'd need to get all the trades from the special coaches. That is, if I could take my own advice from earlier and talk to each of the coaches as I invited them. Needless to say, this was quite demoralizing and I gave up on everything for the night. To pick my mood up a bit, I decided to pivot and talk to Perrin since in between streams, I'd pretty much completed the Pokedex, picking up a shiny Alolan Geodude and even a sleepy shiny Zangus along the way, leaving just four blank entries in my Pokedex, which I assumed, like in the Teal Mask, would be linked to her. My guess was right, because after she realized that I'd already caught way over 200 Pokemon in the terrarium, she showed me some pictures that were just as good as the ones she got of Blood Moon Ursa Luna. Knowing exactly where these were taken, it was only a short trip back to Area Zero and a quick flight on Coridon before I could catch the first of the Paradox Pokemon available in Scarlet, Gouge and Fire. Even with the Pokeball only challenge that I have for any Pokemon that are going to be part of my living decks, this didn't take many attempts at all. Same story with Rage and Bolt, who was hiding a little further down in the crater. With these two cores and another plane ride later, Perrin took a look at the Pokemon that was shown in a photo. For some reason, took pictures of me instead. He told me to keep on keeping on, and that was the side quest complete. This next thing I'm gonna do technically isn't a side quest, or even post-game exclusive. What it is, is a weirdly specific set of instructions that somehow isn't the introduction to a creepypasta. You see, if you go to a spot in the canyon biome where there are some spinning leaves, everything will all of a sudden go quiet. They need to roleplay as a Beyblade, stop, Break out your camera, turn on a sepia filter, and set a random bush until you hear a song. Then, when you spin around, you'll see Meloetta singing a relic song just for you. If you manage to follow all of that, then all you have to do from this point is catch it. <coughs> catch it. After a long day of grinding, I was happy to end the stream by catching Meloetta and having only two Pokemon left in order to complete my Pokedex. These two, as you've probably already guessed, were the future Paradox version exclusives only available in Violet. Thankfully, I have a copy with a mostly completed save, but it still meant me having to complete the Indigo disc. That was oddly convenient timing. <laughs> Catch over 200 Pokemon, which I just ended up catching everything because, and I'm surprised it's got this far into the video without me saying this, I hate myself. Then return to Perrin, look at her badly framed photos, and hunt down the future Paradox Pokemon she showed us. The first, or third, depending on how you want to look at it, was Iron Crown, who took a second, but didn't take all that long in the grand scheme of things. But Iron Boulder, on the other hand, was way more stubborn. 
not staying in any of the balls I threw, even the great ball I chucked by accident. But chat was trying to help me out and came up with the idea that it just needed a little encouragement to stay in the ball. Encouragement in the form of spamming a cheer sound I gave them until it was caught. One little, two, one little okay, go. Yes, there we go. I don't know if this is what happened or if it was just the only place I involved could get some peace and quiet. Regardless, I'd finally caught it. And the cheers didn't stop there. Chat had redeemed so many that they were still going while I'd traded over the future paradoxes to my copy of Scarlet. Touch traded the past paradoxes to complete my Violet Pokedex. And even get the certificate for completing my Scarlet Pokedex. Like I mentioned, I did complete the Pokedex in both games and received the Mark Charm for doing so. There were just a couple things still on my list left to do. One of them being another trip back to Kitakami in order to visit the Crystal Pool at the summit of Oni Mountain. Now, if you didn't know, once you've finished the story of the DLC and caught Terrapagos, a secret final cutscene will be available where Terrapagos will pop out the Pokeball and using some crystal magic something or other, create a myth that pulls the actual Professor Sada from the past so that she can give me her copy of the Scarlet book as part of a trade for the copy of Bri's book that she gave me earlier. Wasn't going to argue with being able to palm this off on her. Thus creating the paradox where she uses the information in Bri's book to create the time machine in the past that eventually results in Briar exploring the depths of Area Zero and writing the book that I just gave to Professor Sada. I'm still not fully sure how Heath plays into this, but my head already hurts enough as is. So it's time to do something mindless and shut off my brain, which means it's back to calling in special coaches and claiming all the special trade Pokemon available. Now, I know this video is getting pretty long at this point, so I'll try and keep it as brief as I can. The Pokemon I traded for were Katie's Combi, Brassius's Sunflora, Iono's Magnemite, Kofu's Falooza, Larry's The Dunce Boss, Rhyme's Grievard, Tulip's Flittle, Grusha's Satoddle, Rika's Wooper, Poppy's Tinkertuff, Clavel's Pomo, Jacques's Gulpin, Rifert's Gimme Ghoul, Time's Rockruff, Salvatore's Meowth, Dendra's Meditite, Hassel's Arctobax, Saguaro's Hatram, Miriam's Marini, Gita's Glimmit, Crispin's Magby, Amorous's Skarmory, Drayton's Duraludon and Lacey's Snubble. I call in most of these coaches because I didn't actually have to call in everyone if it wasn't for me collecting all the trades. I also got the chance to battle some of them for special rewards, which included a Surrender and some Flora case, an Iona's own case, some Ghost Sneakers, Clive's wig, Hexagonal Glasses, the Move to Tears emote, the II Capin emote, some Elite Gloves, a White Blueberry case, and the Finger Heart emote, as well as a Black and Gold track suit, but I already claimed that one earlier. I also unlocked the ability to call in Blueberry Academy's secret boss, who is Director Serrano. Not exactly secret, and I probably could have guessed this a mile off, but it's the last thing I have left to do, so let's do it. I took on a team of Unovan Pokemon, which included all of the Unova starters and somehow came out relatively unscathed, with Plop of the Empoleon taking out his final Pokemon with Aqua Jet to secure the victory. As a reward for breaking his decades long undefeated streak, I unlocked the final trade in the DLC, which was for a Blitzel. A shiny Blitzel? That's actually a pretty worthwhile reward. Oh, and did I say last thing? Because I almost forgot that I still had to fully upgrade the item printer to Great Ball, then Ultra Ball, and finally Master Ball tier. Then complete the super hard mode of Amorous's Fine Trial. And because I got called out in the comments on my TL Mass video, I went back to Kitakami to complete the hard mode of Ogre Austin with my Discord since it had a difficulty rebalance with the latest update that made it a lot more feasible to do. Finally, claiming that special shiny Munchlax reward and 100% of the two DLCs at once, I now had a clean slate heading into the epilogue of the DLC. And also, just a quick update for anyone interested in a total of my living decks with the new Pokemon added. I'm now at 1299 out of 1389. And if you want to see me add to that, play through the epilogue or any futures I make, Maybe think about subscribing or you can just like, share, follow my Twitch channel and the other stuff other YouTubers tell you to do at the end of their videos. But I'm just going to thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one, I guess. Bye.